yeah, my name is Ahmad Aghajani. I here am the postdoctoral researcher at the Research Group, directed by Professor Bagotta. And today I'm going to go through the lessons that I learned over the last five years of doing research here at Software Institute. And rest assured, this talk is not about the research that I did, so it's just very uh, high-level experiences that I gained. So in early days when I came to uh, started my PhD, we decided to conduct an empirical study. And what is an empirical study without being large scale, right? So we decided to parse and analyze around 70,000 different uh, repositories and their histories. So I was not really experienced, but I started writing code and I ran my SQL in different machines to boost things up. But it turned out it's not that easy, and I had to rerun things again and again, over and over. And until we obtained the results, it was too, too late, because we found that we need to change something, and rerunning this whole process was too expensive. And at the end, we had to throw the whole things into the trash can. So this gave me a couple of lessons when dealing with large data. First, I understood that I should start with a smaller set of data when I'm dealing with uh, large data because it, it gives you a sense of data. You can understand what you might expect. You can see what's there and how, are the, how you should deal with unexpected corner cases. And on top, and which like leads me to the fact that you should have a proper exception handling because you never know what you will see. For instance, in recent uh, pro pro project that we had, we have fun projects Java projects, which the method name was in Chinese, which you never imagine, right? And this is also important that your script should be reusable, uh, reusable, re resumable, and it means you should consider the fact that someone might unplug the server. What happens? Do you want to start from scratch? No. So you, one solution could be just to store the results partially when you're doing the process. And also, you should also consider the fact that now CPUs are different cores and you have several CPUs in one machine and you should take advantage of this fact. And there are four approaches toward that. The simplest approach is you just write a single thread code and that's it. You just give the input and it works sequentially. But one step further, you can say, okay, I create copies of this process and I gave different sections of the input to different processes but it's a pain in the neck to handle all these different processes and things. So a more suitable solution would be to write a multi-thread script, which can take an input and automatically you can assign tasks to different threads. And it takes care of everything. But here the caveat is, if you are unlucky, which is usual scenario, you might have threads that are super busy and never finished and you have threads which have nothing to do because their assigned tasks were super easy. So the proper way of doing that, which is the way I usually do, is you should have this extra layer that handles the task, and the threads will ask for a new task, they get it finished, and then ask for a new task. This way, you don't have any bottleneck, and you, have, you make sure always all the threads are busy. And regarding the writing the task in general, writing the code, sorry, in general, so I usually prefer using the databases over the files for two main reasons. First of all, all the results that you have uh, produced will be centralized, so you can easily look at them. You don't need to look for files here and there. And second, you can easily make queries to understand or find something which is not doable with uh, like a file. And the other important thing is I understood that it's better if you write the code reusable and clean, which is not really a thing when you think of it, because you usually write a script for a specific paper, so why do you need to have a clean code here? But the proper, the problem is it's not always the case. In my scenario, for example, in the second year, I wrote a Java parser, and it was not really clean code, and it was really hard-coded things there because I wanted to just finish the task. But it turned out that project, that code was reused in, uh, in several projects later. And I learned a lesson from there. And in the next project that I had, which I was supposed to write a tool to labels, data, and artifacts, 
I made sure the design is clear, clean, and everything is modularized. And also I made a lot of effort and to make it documented. And as a result, this tool came out to be used in several projects later and also used by different research institutes. And besides that, such a tool is a contribution by itself, which is an important thing. Uh, and finally, I understand that usually it's not, it's not easy to write a clean and reusable code because you have deadlines and you're rushing to just uh, reach the deadlines. So what you can do is you can just allocate a few days after your deadline and just make sure the code is clean. And this also helps you to build the replication package because, again, it's something that you need to do, and this is the typical uh, practice nowadays. Concerning the research and conducting research itself, here are the like lessons that I learned. Uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's good always to put yourself into reviewers' shoes because to me, if you can see a weak point in your design, definitely the reviewer can also find it. So it's better if you fix it. And second, uh, I think it's a good and nice practice if you make sure you, are keep tra you keep track of every detail over the process. So what I do is I use OneNote because it's a versatile app. You can embed anything, including the text, images, and even files and voices inside the notes. So the way I handled things was I, from early meetings that we had, I made sure I'm writing down all the research questions that we are going to address, the, the plan that we are going to take, and also all the steps that uh, was taken to conduct the study. And I wrote it in a way that someone else could replicate the work. A good thing about all this uh, steps that I was writing down was the fact that if later we understood that we made some mistakes at some steps, we could easily pick up at the specific steps and we move on. Because the other thing that I forgot to mention is I also, if you look at the image, I also stored all the inputs, outputs of each steps. So it, it, was, it was like a checkpoint for me. And it really helped me a couple of times. And also when you're writing paper later, you don't need to dig into your memories of a few months ago to how you handle things. So you have everything documented there. And the other thing is, it's good to know about the resources that your research group or university is um, uh, like proposing. Especially, I want to highlight here the Qualtrics, which is a survey platform that universities have already per, uh, paid for these subscriptions at Uzi. And you can, it, it's super, like it's superior to the Google Forms and it gives you a lot of statistics when you're conducting the server so you can filter based on the IP and many others like features. And it's free, so you can use it. And the other thing that I learned is that using statistics makes a big difference when you're like uh, publishing in top tier universe, uh, top tier conferences. And in this regard, I found the presentation from Professor Dipenta from CSPA 2018, a valuable resource. Uh, just briefly to mention, uh, the presentation walked us through uh, a couple of evalu the evaluation of a couple of accepted papers as well as rejected papers, and he highlighted why, uh, like the problems of these rejected papers, and also it was a crash course over the practical aspects of statistics that can come in handy when you're writing the paper, like all the tests that can help you to prove the significance of your contribution, all these stuff. To me, this is like a must course. I wish it was part of the introduction to doctoral studies, and I wish we could invite him every year or every the other year to give us this presentation. So to me, if, if I knew about these like, uh, topics earlier, it could really help me. And the last thing that uh, I learned is the contribution here is not necessarily a better result. You can have bad results, but still you can publish it. You may have results which are as good as an existing approach in the literature, but still you can publish it. Imagine you have a tool or approach that can detect um, buggy codes with 60% accuracy. And there are other approaches in the literature that can do the same, can predict the faulty source code with 60% accuracy. How can we sell this new approach? Can we publish something here? 
So the solution here is you can check if your new approach can all, can perform better in certain instance, instances or certain sort of inputs. This will be then a contribution because your approach is doing better in certain scenario. Still, it's 60% accuracy, but still it's a contribution. So it's better if you start learning all these techniques and like tricks in the research, uh, which I didn't know at all when I was starting doing research. Concerning writing the paper, which is not my favorite part of doing research. So I found reading paper really helps in two ways. First of all, it consolidates your background in the field that you're going to become the expert. And also it improves your working writing style by looking at the how people usually write. Second, uh, uh, if your advisor have time, it's better if they can annotate for you and you rewrite things. This was not the case often for us because we usually had little time. But when I when it always came to co-advising a student in my scenario, I made sure I followed this practice and I respected it because it really helps the students to understand how to write a better uh, thesis. And also, when you're writing, it's 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 always better if you stick and remind yourself of the promises that you made in the abstract and the introduction when you're writing. Uh, otherwise, you're just fixing the English in your writing, and it's not really uh, improving the writing when you are doing a pass on the on the paper. And uh, finally, it's it's worthless to say, but now replication package is important thing for every person, every paper. If you really want to make a change in the work, and if you want to, other people can build on top of build up on top of your contribution. You should make sure they have access and they can replicate you what you have done before. So replication package to me is an important thing. And I want to conclude this section with the quote from my advisor, which says. He always publishing a high quality paper is better than publishing a lot of low quality papers, which to me has makes sense a lot. Uh, concerning the presentation, so first of all, don't overlook it because it can easily kill your work. It, I mean, if you attended some conferences, you could easily see how bad presentation can kill the work and also you can achieve a better skills by doing more and more practices, of course. And I think the most important aspects of a presentation is the story and the flow. I mean, Michael always, my previous advisor always told me that the transition between different parts of the presentation makes a big difference and I believe in it. Also, this is an, op the, an opinion which is not popular in my research group. To me, it's the presenting, creating a presentation is not a really, it's really an iterative process. So to me, in the first iteration, you just need to find, to come up with a skeleton and how the contents should be shaped. And gradually you will get closer to the final version. You can work and put effort on the visual aspects. So you don't need to polish things for the very first rehearsal and aligning things and things, because you can just come up uh, with the bad content and you, you need to redo everything. So it's a waste if you start polishing things from this uh, start. And I think everyone agree that if you are presenting a lot of content in a bad way, it's really not a valuable thing. It's better if you present smaller amount of information, but in a way that audience totally understand it. And last but not least, I would recommend Michele's Design 101 and Gabriele's Presentation Tips lesson uh, as part of uh, like a, so next to the, the statistics course that I mentioned before from Observ Dependa, because again, these presentations are a must. They are compact, they are like one less than two hours, but they teach you a lot. And going down a bit to the more concrete uh, things that I really respect when I'm creating slides. So consistency is an important factor for me. Uh, and the way I usually do it, for example, I use different tools. One tool that I want to highlight here is this tool, which you can easily create and search for, not creating, but searching for icons. And you can also customize the colors to the theme of your presentation and provide you different like, quality. So to me, it's super cool. 
Also, make sure you are using the high quality images, and Google here helps you with these options of looking only for large files. Also, exploit the features that you, your presentation application provide, like doing align automatically or using the instance alpha to make an ugly icon to a nice icon or using S size. I mean, do you want really to, to for increasing the size of titles in your S size going one by one over your S size? No, so you should use these S styles to ch do changes across different slides at once. And finally, the things that I didn't know for a long time is when you're doing the presentation, the second screen can really be customized with the way you like it. So leverage. And to me, Keynote is superior to PowerPoint. This is a personal opinion. And also make sure you have this slides number with just a checkbox because then it boosts up the Q&A and people can refer to a specific slide easily. And last but not least, I would highlight the importance of the ending and takeaway message. So you can do it in a different ways, but the easiest way I believe is just at least put the key slides uh, all together in your last slide that people can refer and be refreshed with the content of the presentation easily in a glance. Uh, so quickly about Doctor Symposium, I would say this is a super useful thing. It gives you a great opportunity to discuss your ongoing or future projects with experts in the area. And it also informs you to formulate the problem that you are going to solve and also makes you to think about how you can sell the solutions that you are planning to implement. So it really makes you catch the uh, like uh, errors that you might have. And also it helps you to get early feedback. You don't need to wait for proposal or the desertion review at the end. And also, of course, it shouldn't be later than third year because it doesn't make sense when you have decided your direction, it's hard to change it and you cannot receive major uh, feedback. And moving on to doing visiting research in other institutes. So I had two experience in, the, in my PhD. One was University of Namur and was University of Concordia. One 10 days, one three months. Uh, both failures, so so I'm not really expert in this area to talk about it, but I would say avoid two short visits because it really doesn't work. And also start planning and brainstorming about the ideas before your departure, because when you go there, it takes you a few weeks to get adopted to the environment. And during this time, you cannot really think and come up with new tasks. If you have concrete tasks, you can work on them. But if you want to just start thinking and come up with tasks, it doesn't work. And also make sure you're checking with your destination people if they are on vacation or not. For example, if you're going in Canada in summer, probably you won't find anyone in the office. Uh, talking about reviewing and becoming a PC program, uh, program becoming a program committee member, here are the lessons that I learned over these years. First of all, it's nice if you become a sub-reviewer in your research group, it helps you to build up all the skills you need. And also nowadays we have these shadow pieces, which is a great opportunity. You get mentors, you get feedback on your reviews. But if you don't have a chance to do that, at least ask your advisors for feedback on your early reviews at least, because you probably make big mistakes and you don't want to make an unfair decision for a journal. So it's better you get feedback. Also, you, soon you get messed up with all the emails from different journals as soon as you become uh, reviewers. So it's nice to use labels and you automatic, automatically forward the emails. And also the thing that I didn't know exists, and it's not very like usual to me, you can nominate yourself as a candidate PC in research board. So consider it not weird and do it. And also, it's good if you keep track of the like the decision, the major decision you made on the papers, because when you are later deciding to accept a new review, you should always consider that all those major revision, revisions will come back to you again one day. So there are still ongoing reviews for you. And to me, again, usually reviewing is not the funniest things because 
sometimes the paper is not really in the field that you are expert or you are interested. But remember, this is at least something for your visibility, and you should do it. And this is like a uh, something that you should do in return for your as, as part of your research career. Uh, okay, final thoughts. Uh, so I understood Twitter is the link in the research community. So be active. I was not. And also keep your website up to date, especially before conferences. Again, websites works as the LinkedIn profile in the research community. If you want to understand how people get toasted in PhD, it's better if you attend as many PhD uh, desertion as you can because, yeah, it gives you a lot of ideas how you should handle that day. And also, I found collaboration with external people from other universities very useful because it helps you build your connection, which is something at the end you need after your PhD. You want to land somewhere in some university, so you need to this, have these connections. And one thing that one practice that we are respecting in our research group, which is this group, uh, weekly group meetings, I uh, found it very useful because it helps you. So when you talk about what you are doing, other people can catch uh, like uh, errors that you might have not seen before. So you get, you get early feedbacks, which is again super cool. Uh, so something we are missing, which is the social events nowadays, but hopefully these things should come back. This is something that I really missing in the last two years, but don't forget them. Uh, so I want to conclude things with the survey that we had, so you can hear about the, your colleagues' opinion. Uh, here we had two questions. Uh, one was the top advice for your colleagues, and one was your biggest regret or mistakes. And seven people uh, participated in this survey. Here are the top advice. So quality over quantity, uh, which really to me is a true thing. This is exactly what Miles was also mentioned. And also dedicating time for research, and also trying to get feedbacks from different people, from external people, by attending conferences or volunteering in the conferences which is, again, something that I totally agree. And also, finding a topic that you are passionate, I cannot agree more with that. To me, this is something that I uh, that I, I did, actually, and I think it's a must. And also, don't compare to yourself, and also be professional and enjoy. Uh, going to the biggest regrets, these are the biggest regrets that I collected. So first of all, uh, <laughs> Saying no to unpromising collaboration, <laughs> this is something I think very interesting. Also, uh, staying hungry for learning new things and also, again, collaboration, doing internship. This is something that I missed and I think it's super important doing internship and it helps you build your connections. Uh, learning new things, this is something I already uh, followed, and I think that's it. So I want to thank all the people you know, that have taught me something. I mean, I really appreciate it. And that's that's what I learned over. I mean, this is not I, I, I try to avoid the cliches that people usually say. So I try to make it a bit more personal the presentation, but just to recap things, I talked about the tips about doing research, writing paper, and giving a good presentation. Also, the the, the things that I learned over doing uh, writing code and dealing with big data, especially doing a good multi-threaded code, and also how to become a more successful reviewer, as well as having a more productive visiting. At the end, I recap the your colleague's opinion and that's it. Thank you very much.